picture-perfect couple. A Harvard-educated, multimillionaire family, an icon in Dallas. A playground for the filthy rich. It was this little paradise set down in the middle of the real world. And a murder mystery that had everyone talking. This will be an honest-to-goodness, Perry Mason-style whodunit. He's an intelligent person, but he wasn't a smart criminal. The mistress, the whole incest angle, it was a voyeur's dream. A lone star tale of shattered hopes and poisoned dreams. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. January 9th, 1990. 42-year-old Richard Lyon races through Highland Park, Texas in his Alfa Romeo. He screeches to a halt outside Presbyterian Hospital. He went inside and said, can you help me? My wife is in the car. She's not feeling well. ER personnel went outside and indeed found Nancy Dillard lying in a fetal curl in the passenger seat. Barely conscious, the 37-year-old woman tells doctors she's been feeling ill all day. We did have a round of flu going through Dallas then. Emergency room staff assumed that it was probably the flu and began to treat her. But Nancy fails to respond to treatment. She had low blood pressure, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Pretty quickly it became apparent that it wasn't a typical flu-like situation. And Nancy Dillard Lyon isn't a typical patient. A successful real estate developer, she's also the daughter of Bill Dillard Sr., one of the most prominent and well-connected businessmen in Dallas. Bill Dillard Sr. was known as Big Daddy to everyone, one of the lions of industry in Dallas. The Dillard family was a very wealthy, powerful family, a very quiet power, behind-the-scenes power, but one of the most powerful families in Dallas. Within hours, they had numerous doctors, all different kinds, consulting on the case. They knew they had something other than just a normal or standard disease. The emergency room personnel suspected it was toxic shock syndrome, some sort of a bacterial problem. As friends and family rally around Richard in the waiting room, the staff struggles to make a diagnosis. They began asking all sorts of questions, trying to figure out if she'd been out of the country, what she'd been eating, trying to determine what actually was wrong with her. They did everything that you would normally do, but everything they did seemed to fail. The doctors and nurses were baffled. Suddenly, Nancy takes a turn for the worse. Her symptoms progressed fairly quickly, from the vomiting and diarrhea to convulsions. Her respiratory system was failing, her renal system was failing, and they couldn't reverse that process. And soon she lapsed into a coma. Five days later, on January 14th, the family was informed in no uncertain terms that Nancy was brain dead. Ultimately, the family decided to pull the plug on Nancy's life. Nancy Dillard Lyon's demise was the talk of the town. Everyone wanted to know how a seemingly healthy young socialite could have met such an abrupt and horrific fate. I think it was a tremendous shock. Overflow funeral, absolute door-to-door, wall-to-wall packed with people. Tremendous grief over her death. The initial reaction was purely grief. Very few suspected that this was anything more than a tragic death as a result of some strange bacterial problem. But behind closed doors at the Dillard Mansion, suspicion builds. They thought maybe foul play had occurred and contacted the district attorney's office. 
While Richard signs the papers for an autopsy, Big Daddy pressures the authorities to take a closer look. We've got people that are suspecting things, but we still didn't have a cause of death. We had no idea and in, until an autopsy was run. Doctors said it was toxic shock, so our hands are a little tied on what, how much we can do. But the stories that Dillard's have to tell pique investigators' interests. There was a curious incident where someone left a bottle of wine on her porch, along with a bottle of pills, with a message that said to a special lady uh, from a secret admirer. Their family thought that possibly those things got her sick. According to Richard, Nancy had been receiving threatening mail for months. A former boss of Nancy's was involved in some very, very acrimonious litigation. Nancy's testimony had hurt him uh, a great deal in that. And the threats are still coming. Richard got a mysterious phone call on the home answering machine saying, she got hers and you're next. Then, investigators receive a phone call from the morgue. The medical examiner's office informed me that the cause of death for Nancy Dillard Lyon was arsenic poisoning. Toxicology reports came back showing that she had 100 times the normal amount of arsenic in her body. Once we got back those autopsy results, it became a murder case. At one time, arsenic was known as the king of poisons and the poison of kings. The ideal weapon when you wanted to dispatch an enemy without drawing attention to yourself. Now it had claimed the princess of the park cities. But who was the culprit? Days after Nancy Dillard Lyon's mysterious death, her autopsy reveals fatal levels of arsenic. They quickly rule out Nancy's former boss, then start taking a look closer to home. I contacted Mr. Dillard Sr. at his home after the funeral and requested a meeting with him. He went over many things, uh, concerns that Nancy had discussed. Prior to her death, Nancy had confided in her father about problems at home. Nancy Lyon was a very private person. She had been involved with her husband in a separation. The Dillard family were not aware of the problems until just shortly before she became ill. Then, Big Daddy dropped some big news. Bill Dillard Sr. said, we think he may have been trying to kill her. By he, he's referring to his own son-in-law, Richard Lyon. But all Big Daddy has to go on is gut instinct. And investigators will need more than finger pointing to solve the case. We really didn't have a lot. We've got family suspicions, but we don't have enough to do much. It was such a far out thing to consider that he could do something, that a person could kill his wife and the mother of his children over anything. Were Richard's long lashes and doleful eyes hiding the soul of a monster? And if he had poisoned his wife, why? To find out, investigators would have to peer behind the facade of Nancy Dillard Lyon's fairy tale life. Nancy Dillard was the youngest of four children, described as kind of bookish and shy, pretty young woman, smart as a whip, ambitious, very much her, her father's daughter in that regard. Nancy grew up rich. They lived in a huge home, went to Highland Park High School. None of these kids ever wanted for anything. While most of her friends chose big Texas universities, Nancy decided on Hollins, a prestigious women's college in Virginia. A few years later, Nancy found her calling in landscape architecture and design. She was inspired to apply for the School of Design at Harvard University. There, sitting in one of her classes, was a young Connecticut man named Richard Lyon. Richard certainly wasn't raised poverty-stricken, but he didn't come from anywhere near the wealth that Nancy Lyon did. His father was an insurance agent with five kids and a modest salary. They were a, a middle-class striver type of family. 
Despite their different backgrounds, Nancy and Richard quickly fell in love. They were always together. He was a quieter person. She was kind of the personality or the energy in the relationship. They were education equals. They studied a lot together. He learned to mimic her handwriting, and she learned to mimic his handwriting, and she wrote some of his term papers for him. And by the time they got out of graduate school, they pretty well decided they were going to get married. After a lavish wedding, the couple settled in the Park Cities. If you ask anybody in Dallas where the most influential, the wealthiest people live, they're going to tell you the Park Cities. The Park Cities are known in the Dallas area as the bubble. It's kind of an insular country club scene. These are people who have money or want to have money. They made the reasoned decision to live in Dallas largely on the advice of Richard. Big Daddy knew everybody in Dallas. He could come up with jobs for both of them very quickly. As a Connecticut Yankee in Big Daddy's court, you think Richard would have had trouble adjusting. But to the Dillard's pleasant surprise, their new son-in-law was, as they say in Texas, happy as a gopher in soft dirt. He left the lines behind and became a Dillard, and he adapted to it really well. The money, the influence, having the family name that gets you the jobs, and he fit right in. From all accounts, from when they were first married, typical Park City's yuppie couple, very much in love, very happy. Nancy worked for Trammell Crow, the Donald Trump of Texas, huge developer. She was very well known in her professional life. But despite their two incomes, the couple never seemed to keep their heads above water. They had no assets to speak of. Their home was heavily mortgaged. Their Alfa Romeo automobile was, you know, it was purchased on a credit card for God's sakes. Fortunately, there was always someone there to bail them out. Nancy's father, Big Daddy, was basically allowing them to continue to live on a month-to-month -month basis by paying off their bills. She was struggling hard to keep her marriage perfect, her children perfect, her job perfect. And she's tried very hard to please both her parents, but primarily her father. But as detectives soon discover, while Nancy was trying to keep up appearances, her storybook marriage was starting to show cracks. Nancy and Richard's life began to change in the late 80s. Richard was working as a construction project manager in Houston, so he was out of town frequently. He often took trips with another project manager, a young woman named Tammy. During one of their trips, they started an affair. Still, Richard was committed to Nancy and agreed to find his own apartment while the couple worked through their problems. She loved him. She'd built her plans around them being together in a perfect family. She wanted her children to be with their father. Friends tell investigators that in December, the couple reconciled and Richard moved back inside the bubble. It seemed like they'd put their troubles behind them. Mr. Dillard confided with me that the family liked Richard. Nancy married him. He was the father of his grandkids and he was accepted back into the family. They spent Christmas together in Connecticut, but their happy reunion was short-lived. A little over a week later, Nancy was admitted to the hospital and never came home. In the days following his daughter's death, Big Daddy is plagued with lingering doubts about Richard, but there's still no proof to support his suspicion. There was two views of Nancy and Richard. One was a happy couple, parents of two young daughters that all family and friends adored. Then there was the couple that was having a problem with their marriage. But these weren't things that build a murder case. Investigators focus on Richard's behavior as his wife lay dying in the hospital. Well, it's hard to tell how someone's going to react. The nurses and doctors related to us that it was more like a social event for him. Some of the nurses indicated that he even flirted with them. He never acted like the concerned husband whose wife is in intensive care and could pass away at any moment. He was too calm and collected for that kind of incident. Then, detectives track down Richard's ex-girlfriend and make a shocking discovery. According to her, the fling 
was far from over. He was talking to the girlfriend while Nancy was dying in the hospital. Tammy Ann, the young blue-eyed blonde, tells police she and Richard were together before and after Nancy's death. Richard would spend like a drunken sailor when it came to Tammy. He bought her gifts, he bought her uh, $4,500 watch, he bought her expensive leather coat, he would take her on trips to the Colorado mountains, to Taos, New Mexico. A week before Nancy had been admitted to the hospital, Richard told Tammy his wife was dying. Richard had told her when he took Nancy back home for Christmas to Connecticut, he had told the girlfriend that he was taking her to a hospital up there for an incurable blood disease she was dying from. Nancy's family was incensed and jaws dropped at police headquarters as well. Police have finally established a possible motive for murder, but other than Richard's unhusbandly behavior, they don't have a lot to go on. It was different than most murder cases. We knew we weren't going to find someone that said we saw him do it. The choice of weapon was the unique factor in this murder investigation. I wasn't looking for a gun a knife, a club. I was looking for proof that Richard Lyon had poisoned his wife. But that solid proof was still out of reach for the investigators. With no witnesses and no traces of arsenic in the Lyon home, Richard may have just gotten away with the perfect crime. After the arsenic poisoning of socialite Nancy Dillard Lyon, suspicion swirls around her husband Richard. But without any hard evidence, police can't risk tipping their hand. And they ask the Dillards to play along. Even though they were convinced by that point that he was responsible for Nancy's situation, they had to maintain a facade. I think it was strained, and, and I don't think he sought out their company, but they still kept up the front that they were there for him taking care of him and they were all grieving together but out from under the dillard's gaze richard is hardly the mournful widower shortly after his wife died his girlfriend was at the house a lot with with their daughters i thought if you know suspicious and very bad taste if if nothing else and investigators see other red flags richard lyon never made a concern call to find out why his wife had died how she had died those are questions that most family members want to know right away and he never called me or the medical examiner's office for weeks they contact chemical distributors hoping for a break we were looking for a needle in a haystack as far as where he could have bought poisons where he could have ordered some of these things then, a company in Houston delivers some promising news. Their records revealed not one, but four separate purchases made by a Richard Lyon. He had purchased quite a laundry list of various types of poisons. Richard Lyon had purchased chemicals as early as January of 1990, and the last purchase, November 27th of 1990. He purchased mercury, barium carbonate, sodium nitroferrocyanide, arsenic, arsenic standard, arsenic trioxide. Anything that had the word cyanide or arsenic or typical things that you associate as being a poison, he was ordering. We had the checks and the people actually at the lab in Houston that were selling him the chemicals, they could ID him. Records reveal Richard had some of the packages shipped to his office. We had his employers at the company he worked for telling us that they were a natural organic company. They did not use those type of things. It just solidified that the investigation was going in the right direction. Detectives ask Richard to come down to headquarters for an interview. When they inform him of Nancy's cause of death, Richard is oddly unemotional. He wasn't surprised that she'd been poisoned. He didn't show any reaction very calm, very collected about the whole thing. Now you would think your wife had died a month before from a very strange arsenic poisoning, but he didn't ask how she could have got it. No questions. When they ask him how Nancy could have come in contact with arsenic, Richard coolly informs them 
he and Nancy were developing a new formula for killing insects. Both were semi-inventors. They were working on ways to kill fire ants. Richard had actually done some drawings where he drilled down into the mound and put the arsenic at the base of the mound to kill the queen. With nothing to hold him on, detectives are forced to turn Richard loose. We were trying to do as much as we could do. We're trying to get all of our forensic evidence that we can find gathered together because we don't need him any more suspicious than he is. The police could only keep Nancy's cause of death from the press for so long. When word of the poisoning leaked out, Dallas was a buzz. Neighbors of 37-year-old Nancy Dillard Lyon say they can't understand why anyone would want to kill this mother of two. Her death was a tremendous shock, but it's a different sort of shock when you find out that a young mother and an upstanding member of the community, in fact, had been murdered. There was a lot of interest in this case. This is a Highland Park family who uh, have a ton of money, and um, I think people were attracted to the fact that it was a whodunit. Police are remaining tight-lipped about the suspect and the progress of the investigation. The thing was pretty much a media circus. And there was just as much untrue information in the newspapers as there was true information. And there was a lot of wild speculation. With pressure mounting and the Dallas elite demanding answers, police go public. Police investigators confirm they have only one suspect in their probe of the arsenic murder of Nancy Dillard Lyon. Police say they are looking hard at her husband, Richard Lyon. With the heat turning up, Here's where marrying Rich may have saved his skin. Richard hired the most expensive lawyer he could find and hunkered down for the fight of his life. Days after police name Richard Lyon as their prime suspect, his newly retained defense attorney holds a press conference. There was a lot of talk in the community, and I could walk into a barbershop or something and could hear people talking about the case. There was a tremendous feeling that Richard was guilty. And as a result of that, you have an entirely negative climate that's built up against your client. Contrary to the uh, accusations uh, made recently by the police, uh, I did not poison my wife, Nancy Dillard Lyon, nor did I have anything to do with her tragic death. I can tell you that our investigation on his behalf is very thorough. In the event that this case becomes a murder charge, this will be an honest-to-goodness, Perry Mason-style whodunit. Investigators decide it's time to make their move. With the girlfriend and receipts linking him to chemicals, their case is circumstantial, but convincing. We knew we'd never get a confession from Richard that he had done this. We knew we weren't gonna find someone that said we saw him do it. We decided we had enough when we knew we weren't gonna get any more. On a May morning, five months after Nancy's death, Richard is charged with first degree murder. Brian was driving down Preston Road early this morning after dropping his two daughters off at childcare. Police pulled him over, which apparently came as a total surprise. Richard Lyon looked terrified to be in that situation, maybe a little shocked to be in that situation, but absolutely terrified. Richard Lyon's arrest warrant paints a damaging picture of a man who says he didn't do it. Police later learned Richard Lyon ordered and purchased barium carbonate, arsenic, and other chemicals through his employer. The employer tells police Lyon is not authorized to order such chemicals. Richard's bluff had been called. Everyone in Dallas was ready to send him to the chair. But he wasn't about to fold his hand because he had one naughty little card left to play. I got a call one night, a little after 10 o'clock from Richard, and he said, you need to come over here right now. I found something. I get up, get dressed, I go over there, and Richard is in the bedroom, and he's found notes from Nancy and in those notes are are things that where Nancy expresses a fear of sex when she's not in control she feels helpless then Richard reveals a dark family secret Richard had relayed to me that he had learned that Nancy had had 
an incestuous relationship with her brother. When Nancy Lyon was 11 years old and her brother Bill Dillard Jr. was 13, their mother caught them having sex. She was horrified. The family's reaction beyond sending Bill Jr. away to boarding school was apparently virtually nil. I think it was something that stayed with uh, Nancy for her whole life. In fact, when Richard began having an affair, she partially blamed herself. In the year before her death, old wounds had resurfaced. Her father, Big Daddy, insisted that his children had simply been playing doctor, that it was perfectly normal. Nancy knew it wasn't perfectly normal, that it was far beyond perfectly normal. She was a very messed up young lady inside. Do I think she's desperate? I think absolutely. Richard's probably the first man in her life she ever really loved and trusted. And so when he was thinking about moving out and getting a divorce, I think that was very traumatic for her. Richard tells his lawyers that while they were separated, he noticed that Nancy had received a bouquet of flowers. Nancy told him that these flowers had been sent by the school where the girls were enrolled. Richard looked at the card and it said something like, we're so sorry that you're being treated like you are by your husband. We were able to trace those flowers and Nancy had sent them to herself. Was the same true of the bottle of wine and pills she supposedly found on her doorstep? Nancy said that she found a bottle of wine on the front porch of the duplex and that even though it was uncorked, she drank it. Okay, let me rewind that. This is a woman who went to Harvard, a smart woman, she finds a bottle of wine on the front porch of her house and she drinks it and she in a very dramatic way gives the bottle of wine to to the nanny and says if anything happens to me you please give this to the authorities the defense also learns that nancy admitted herself to the hospital several times before her final visit i have no doubt that several of the hospital visits that she had before then were faint there was never any real diagnosis of what was wrong with her on any of those. But it was effective because every time she would do that, Richard would rush to her bedside and pay particular attention to her. But the most puzzling revelation comes from the defense team's toxicology expert. I sent the hair samples, the fingernail samples, blood samples, it all for routine analysis. And it was very, very strange what came back. If someone is exposed to arsenic, the level of arsenic in their hair and in their fingernails should be roughly the same. And in this case, the arsenic in Nancy's fingernails was five times the amount of the arsenic in her hair. The only forensic explanation for that was that Nancy had personally touched the arsenic with her hands. The results also show that the highest doses of arsenic were ingested three weeks before Nancy's death and the day she went to the hospital. The state can only put arsenic in his hand about seven days before she went into the hospital. The conclusion then was that Nancy must have been ingesting the arsenic herself. The blame the victim defense usually turns my stomach, but you have to admit Guthrie laid out a pretty compelling case. Dallas had a crime for the ages on its hands, and people couldn't wait to hear all the sordid details. In the days leading up to Richard Lyon's murder trial, the people of Dallas are braced for a soap opera-style drama. The high-profile family, Harvard graduates, living in park cities, that was kind of an attention grabber. And then secondly, arsenic poisoning, those don't come up very often. People outside of the bubble would get a chance to peer inside the bubble. It was a voyeur's dream. Even for Texas, where so many trials, so many crimes seem to be Texas-sized, this was going to be a dandy. When the trial opens, the prosecution is confident the jury will connect the dots. I would have loved to have been able to show when he ordered chemicals and had a direct timeline and path from the company to him to her mouth. 
but I knew we were right. I knew that he was the right guy. There was obvious physical evidence showing that the woman had been poisoned, evidence indicating that Richard Lyon had purchased the poison. There was ample evidence of his love affair. I think that uh, people felt it was the prosecution's case to lose. But Richard's side tries to poke holes in the state's circumstantial case. Take the fact that this guy went to Harvard. He's a smart guy. And he sets out, according to the prosecution's theory, to murder his wife by poisoning her with arsenic. Do you really think that a guy like that is going to go buy arsenic under his name and have it shipped to his business address? There'd be a clear paper trail. And I think it's important to remember that Richard is the one who insisted that Nancy go to the hospital. I frankly always thought it was strange that a guy would poison his wife and then take her to the hospital. I wouldn't poison my wife, but if I was, I think I'd wait till she was dead before I called anybody. And I would make sure I wasn't there while she was dying. As opening arguments begin, the courthouse is jam-packed with spectators. There was something like 1,400 people down there trying to get 86 seats. Well, it's packed every day. And it was packed with well-to-do people. And there was a lot of media there. The Dillards had actually engineered it so that they had people coming in to fill the galleries. They actually had a schedule of people to come to trial to fill the seats up. The only two people in the courtroom that were for Richard were his parents. The prosecutor comes out swinging more than punches. We were a little distracted by the prosecuting attorney's hair. Uh, Jerry Sims has like, had, I don't know, knee length, hip length hair that when she got up, she would kind of flip it. But a lot of the reporters commented on it. You know, okay, here comes the hair again. Ms. Sims was stealing the spotlight. After one particularly dramatic entrance to the courtroom, one of the Dillard socialite supporters was heard to say, my kingdom for a pair of scissors. I think that he hated Nancy, but I think the main thing, he wanted that Dillard name still attached to him. He influenced the family, the jobs they could get him. He could not divorce her and keep those things. He wasn't Mr. Nice Guy. He felt that by slowly poisoning her, it would look like she was just a sick woman and no one would know the difference. So how did the suspect deliver the poison? The prosecution doesn't know for sure, but a shocking discovery at Richard's old apartment gives them a likely M.O. The young lady that was living there was looking for some medication in her medicine cabinet and ran across a pill bottle. It was medication for Nancy Lyon. Tests revealed that someone had tampered with the pills and laced them with cyanide. These were capsules that I believe Richard was giving to Nancy. She didn't know that she was daily being poisoned by him. I think he was experimenting with different things, trying to find out what he could give her that would kill her. We had the evidence that he had ordered different types of compounds with arsenic in it. We had the checks and the people actually at the lab that were selling in the chemicals. But the prosecution is still missing a few pieces of the puzzle. The forensic evidence indicated that she had a large dose of arsenic about three weeks prior to going into the hospital. Another dose probably on the day she went into the hospital. That was a period before the state could ever put any arsenic in Richard's hands. The more likely suspect, they say, is Nancy herself. The defense paints her as a desperate woman dealing with the painful scars of incest. Nancy, needless to say, had a lot of issues. Her husband was sleeping with another woman. She was facing divorce. The defense saw that as a vulnerability. I think they saw Nancy as being a viable candidate for suicide. The notes Richard found after Nancy died are submitted as evidence and read aloud to the gallery. Trying hard to have the June Cleaver family busy, frustrated, anxious, demanding, controlling, too accomplishment oriented, hurts my family life. When I don't have power, I feel inadequate. And when I don't feel in control, I get angry. Fear of Bill and what his desires are, sex, sick sex, incest issues with me. An already stunned courtroom is then hit with another surprise. 
when the defense reveals a receipt from a company named Chemical Engineering. The owner, Charles Couch, takes the stand. Couch explained that he took a phone call from a woman who asked about poisons that might help eradicate a fire ant problem in her backyard. The woman identified herself as Nancy Lyon. The invoice has Nancy's work number on it, it has her home phone number, and it has a Texas driver's license number. The invoice from Couch's firm showed that she had purchased the chemicals. The only forensic explanation for Nancy having five times the amount of arsenic on her fingernails is that she had to have touched the arsenic. And I think that what happened in this case is that Nancy ingested arsenic herself in a bizarre plot to try to keep Richard in the marriage. And she accidentally put too much arsenic in her blood. And I think that's what killed her. Richard's attorney had kept his promise. This was truly a Perry Mason-style turn of events. But this Texas tale had one more unbelievable twist. In the final days of testimony, the state tries to rebut the assertion that Nancy Dillard Lyon poisoned herself. We investigated every possibility. Maybe she had done it to herself. Maybe she had accidentally ingested it. The first thing that the doctor told us, there's no way you would use arsenic to kill yourself. She was in such pain, it was horrible. I mean, her organs shut down over a long period of time. The medical examiner said nobody would put themselves through that. The prosecution also has to account for the high levels of arsenic in Nancy's fingernails. My explanation for that was, and the doctors seemed to agree, the throwing up and that it would have arsenic in it, that you could get that on your hands and it would change the arsenic levels in your fingernails. The state then calls a handwriting expert to analyze Nancy's notes. The handwriting seemed just slightly different from those last notes about the incest and the rest of the notations on the page. Nancy and Richard had gone to graduate school together. They had learned to write like each other so they could work on each other's projects. If you took one writing by him, one by her, it looked almost identical. And that FBI expert in handwriting, he could definitively say, she did not write these things. These are forgeries. Without equivocation, he said the notes about incest were made in the hand of Richard Lyon. Then, the state delivers a final blow. On rebuttal, Charles Couch returns to the stand and tells the jury the typed receipt doesn't belong to his company. He always hand wrote his receipts. He never typed them out. Someone had copied the chemical engineering letterhead, had placed it on a blank receipt, and the list of the chemicals were added to the receipt page, making it look like a legitimate receipt for a purchase. That, I think, did it for me, and I think for some others, too, that was kind of hard to refute. The couch testimony was an indication of a lie, and juries don't like to be lied to. Above all else, juries don't like to be lied to. It takes the jury less than an hour to return with their verdict. Is that verdict? We, the jury, find the defendant Richard Allen Abu Lyon guilty as charged in the indictment. Okay, thank you. I don't think a single person in the courtroom was surprised by the verdict except Richard Lyon. He could not believe it. He could not believe he had been convicted. Three weeks later, the judge decides his fate. I started getting all these letters in, and there were a lot of them. I think most of them were really in support of harsh punishment for him. I start thinking about what does it take to go buy arsenic and plan to give it in doses to your wife, the mother of your children. I don't care how much you dislike her or how much you may want to be with somebody else. There are options like divorce. And I just started to see a picture of a guy who really needed to be punished severely. Richard receives the maximum life in prison. For Big Daddy and the rest of the Dillard clan, the long and painful wait is finally over. It was the family that went to the police department and told them of their suspicions, and if they hadn't done that, they never would have autopsied the body and they never would have known she was poisoned. They had powerful friends, certainly a lot of wealth, 
And I think we're maybe more educated about pursuing justice for their daughter than someone with maybe not so much wealth would have been able to do. More than a decade later, Richard's attorneys continue to defend him. Well, my grandfather used to have a saying. He says, it sticks in my craw. Based on all of the evidence, I don't feel like that Richard should have been convicted. I think that the forensic evidence is highly significant. How could Nancy's fingernail get that arsenic on it? I mean, that's huge. When I went to see Mr. Couch before he testified, we both looked at the invoice. He did not raise any issue that it was not his receipt at all. Clearly, Mr. Couch thought that he was going to be in trouble for selling those chemicals. I think his testimony was to protect himself. But there aren't many other people in the Park Cities losing sleep over Richard's fate. Richard Lyon was very cold. He had an air of superiority about him. I don't think he ever thought he would get caught. He was obviously confident enough to go back and forge documents and not expect us to catch that. Richard Lyon thought he was better than the law. He's an intelligent person, but he wasn't a smart criminal. People like Richard Lyon can't see beyond losing the lifestyle. They don't necessarily want the spouse anymore, but they don't want to lose the lifestyle that the spouse allowed them to live. People assume if I had a lot of money, I'd sure be a lot happier. I wouldn't have any problems. Well, the reality of it is how much money you have and where you went to school doesn't matter. You know, we're all human, and we can fall prey to all of our inadequacies, and that's certainly true in this case. Among the ways of committing murder, poisoning requires an especially cold heart. Richard Lyon watched a person he once loved die a slow and painful death. Too bad he hasn't gotten a taste of his own medicine. For True TV, I'm Dominic Dunn. Picture perfect couple. A Harvard educated, multimillionaire family, an icon in Dallas. A playground for the filthy rich. It was this little paradise set down in the middle of the real world. And a murder mystery that had everyone talking. This will be an honest to goodness, Perry Mason style whodunit. He's an intelligent person, but he wasn't a smart criminal. The mistress, the whole incest angle, it was a voyeur's dream. A Lone Star tale of shattered hopes and poisoned dreams. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. January 9th, 1990. 42-year-old Richard Lyon races through Highland Park, Texas in his Alfa Romeo. He screeches to a halt outside Presbyterian Hospital. He went inside and said, can you help me? My wife is in the car. She's not feeling well. ER personnel went outside and indeed found Nancy Dillard Lyon in a fetal curl in the passenger seat. Barely conscious, the 37-year-old woman tells doctors she's been feeling ill all day. We did have a round of flu going through Dallas then. Emergency room staff assumed that it was probably the flu and began to treat her. But Nancy fails to respond to treatment. She had low blood pressure, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Pretty quickly it became apparent that it wasn't a typical flu-like situation. And Nancy Dillard Lyon isn't a typical patient. A successful real estate developer, she's also the daughter of Bill Dillard Sr., one of the most prominent and well-connected businessmen in Dallas. Bill Dillard Sr. was known as Big Daddy to everyone, one of the lions of industry in Dallas. The Dillard family was a very wealthy, powerful family, a very quiet power. 
behind the scenes power for one of the most powerful families in Dallas. Within hours, they had numerous doctors, all different kinds, consulting on the case. They knew they had something other than just a normal or standard disease. The emergency room personnel suspected that it was toxic shock syndrome, some sort of a bacterial problem. As friends and family rally around Richard in the waiting room, the staff struggles to make a diagnosis. They began asking all sorts of questions, trying to figure out if she'd been out of the country, what she had been eating, trying to determine what actually was wrong with her. They did everything that you would normally do, but everything they did seemed to fail. The doctors and nurses were baffled. Suddenly, Nancy takes a turn for the worse. Her symptoms progressed fairly quickly, from the vomiting and diarrhea to convulsions. Her respiratory system was failing, her renal system was failing, and they couldn't reverse that process. And soon she lapsed into a coma. Five days later, on January 14th, the family was informed in no uncertain terms that Nancy was brain dead. Ultimately, the family decided to pull the plug on Nancy's life. Nancy Dillard Lyon's demise was the talk of the town. Everyone wanted to know how a seemingly healthy young socialite could have met such an abrupt and horrific fate. I think it was a tremendous shock. Overflow funeral, absolute door-to-door, wall-to-wall packed with people. Tremendous grief over her death. The initial reaction was purely grief. Very few suspected that this was anything more than a tragic death as a result of some strange bacterial problem. But behind closed doors at the Dillard Mansion, suspicion builds. They thought maybe foul play had occurred and contacted the district attorney's office. While Richard signs the papers for an autopsy, Big Daddy pressures the authorities to take a closer look. We've got people that are suspecting things, but we still didn't have a cause of death. We had no idea and in, until an autopsy was run. Doctors said it was toxic shock, so our hands are a little tied on what, how much we can do. But the stories that Dillards have to tell pique investigators' interests. There was a curious incident where someone left a bottle of wine on her porch, along with a bottle of pills, with a message that said to a special lady, uh, from a secret admirer. Their family thought that possibly those things got her sick. According to Richard, Nancy had been receiving threatening mail for months. A former boss of Nancy's was involved in some very, very acrimonious litigation. Nancy's testimony had hurt him uh, a great deal in that. And the threats are still coming. Richard got a mysterious phone call on the home answering machine saying she got hers and you're next. Then, investigators receive a phone call from the morgue. 